to another episode of the Champions of Home Care podcast. As most of you already know, on this podcast, we explain home care service programs and bring you a lot of the latest news about home care in Minnesota. Plus, we share community resources, tips, and tricks for the many older adults and people of all ages with disabilities in Minnesota. Yeah, thank you, Jason. And each episode, we brought on someone with unique expertise that can help uh, home care clients, caregivers, case managers, social workers across the state. And today, I'm sure you'll agree with me, uh, Jason, that we have another great conversation lined up. Joining us today is Philip Cryan, who is the Executive Vice President of SEIU Healthcare in Minnesota and Iowa. Um, SEIU briefly is a union that unites about 50,000 healthcare and long-term care workers in home care, nursing homes, plus hospitals and clinics throughout Iowa and the land of 10,000 lakes here in Minnesota. Philip, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? Doing great. Really glad to be here with both of you. Wonderful. Thanks, Philip. And also joining us today is Gail Larson, who is an ACRA employed caregiver. Gail, how are you doing today? Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. We are so appreciative of both of you being here with us today. And we think this is going to be a really valuable and interesting conversation for our listeners to, to hear. Um, Philip, why don't you start out by just telling us a little bit about SEIU and what the union seeks to secure for home care workers in Minnesota? Absolutely. Um, again, it's really a pleasure to be with you all. Um, so SEIU is a union, a, a workers organization. Um, we, as uh, David just mentioned, represent an, uh, uh, healthcare workers in a number of different parts of the industry in hospitals, clinics, nursing homes. But what brings us here today and what's uh, brought us into a uh, partnership with ACRA over a number of years now is our work with home healthcare workers, PCAs, mm -hmm. uh, paid parents, other people who are doing uh, home and community based services. And uh, back in 2013, the Minnesota legislature changed the uh, the laws that govern unionization and how which workers can form a union and how to extend an opportunity for a huge group of home care workers who didn't previously have the right to organize a union to do so. And in 2014, but, uh, the, the largest union election by far in the history of Minnesota uh, was won by thousands of, of home care workers, um, just like Gail. And, uh, and ever since then, we have been bargaining contracts with the state of Minnesota, where a group of home care workers and clients sits on one side of the bargaining table and representatives of the executive branch of state government sit on the other side of the table. We do this every two years and we bargain over wages and benefits and working conditions. Um, we've made progress in every one of those agreements, sometimes more, uh, sometimes a lot less than we had hoped for. We've been building and building, and as uh, Gail will share um, at some point in this this conversation here on the podcast today, our newest agreement that just went into effect um, is is really a, a a game changer for for home care workers and the people that they serve. Well, Philip, thank you. That's a, a great introduction to the value of SEIU and and, and the opportunities that it brings for direct care workers across the state of Minnesota. And I don't know if you recall or not, but Years and years ago, in my previous life, at my previous employer, I recall you and I sitting down having a conversation about the value of organizing direct care workers before all this organizing took place. But we sat down and talked about the value of it and what kind of support the organization I was with at the time might provide for that. It was a very stirring conversation. I was very excited about the opportunity that it would bring to direct care workers. That being said, as you also mentioned, in each, every two years in the legislature, you uh, and SEIU engage in that negotiation process. Can you talk a little bit about some of the outcomes of this most recent negotiation that took place during the 2023 legislative session? I will turn it to uh, one of the members of the bargaining team that fought for and won that great contract, Gail, to, uh, to answer that one. Oh, great. Gail, please. Yes, I did have the pleasure of being on the bargaining team and I enjoyed it. It was very a great experience to um, talk with the 
people across the table from me and get to this contract. It's so exciting. Um, I got goose pimples. We won so much. Um, first of all, um, what started in July already of this year, we have a few new holidays added to our list. So we have three new holidays, um, Juneteenth, Independence Day, and Veterans Day, um, along with the other ones. But the most exciting, January 1st of 2024, we go up to $19 an hour. That is exciting. Um, so that's a huge up to 25% from the wage floor from before. So that that is very exciting to help people to have a living wage finally. January uh, 1st of 2025, the wage starts at $20 an hour for new workers. And then we start a wage scale, which that is amazing for people that have more experience, get a higher wage. So that's exciting. And Gail, if I'm not mistaken, in that in that tiered or wage scale, as you describe it, that tiered uh, basis, there are five different categories of wage opportunities. I believe so. Sorry, I don't know the details of it. I just know that I jumped to the highest right away oh, uh, because marvelous. I have been a caregiver for so long. I will jump to the top tier um, right away. There could be, I was looking to see if I had the tier and I do not, I do not have that in front of me. So I can, I can, I can, yeah. knows that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and all of the information about what's in the collective bargaining agreement, the union contract can be found on our website, which is SEIU healthcare, MN, uh, IA dot org. Uh, and then you look Fantastic. for contracts and then home care and then open up the, your home care contract. Um, so there are five tiers and it's based on your cumulative hours worked dating back to, I believe it's 2017. Um, okay. just, and that's just because that's when we have data stretching back to. Um, and uh, at different thresholds of hours, your starting wage or your, your minimum wage under the contract could be anywhere from $20 an hour to $22.50. Uh, and again, that's starting mm -hmm. January 1st of uh, 2025 after going to $19 an hour January 1st coming up. The other thing I want to add to what Gail uh, mentioned that hopefully a lot of you, this is old news by now, we certainly have been reaching out a lot uh, to many of you to make sure you get the news that the $1,000 retention stipends are available. Um, and there are plenty of them. Um, this is not a situation where they're going to uh, run out or, or are at all likely to run out. So if you have been working for six months or more as a home care worker, in the PCA Choice Program, CDCS, or CSG, then you are eligible for a $1,000 retention stipend. Um, there's information on our website as well as the Department of Human Services website, and we can also help you uh, kind of guide you through the process to make sure that you get that money that we were able to win uh, as part of this union contract. Um, Philip, would you stay on that point for just a moment? Because I know that that, that $1,000 retention bonus is going to be very, very important to a lot of employees at ACRA. Could you talk for just a little bit more about how to go about accessing that thousand dollar bonus? Because it's not, it's not paid out by ACRA. Is Correct. I understand. Correct. So, um, so this is something we were able to win because um, the state uh, insisted that they couldn't do a big wage increase, which they agreed to until January 1st of next year. So we would have six months of our contract without the ability to get a big wage increase for kind of technical bureaucratic reasons. So we eventually realized, well, there's something we could do in the meantime, we could do a bonus to kind of help people in the meantime before the big change of the $19 minimum wage kicks in. Uh, and so we ultimately agreed on a, a $1,000 retention stipend. Again, you have to have worked for six months uh, in the bargaining unit, the, the SEIU bargaining unit, in order to be eligible. Um, and we can you know, check that for you. Um, and the way that you apply, it's through uh, a website that is run by a contractor for the state. And it's the same process that some of you will be familiar with uh, if you have ever gotten the $500 training stipend that also is part of our union contract, that's been in place for a number of years. It's the same organization and the same website. 
um, that, that operates this retention stipend. All you have to do is fill out some kind of basic identifying information about yourself. Uh, and then we just have to verify your eligibility that, that you are in fact a worker in the bargaining unit and you have been so for six months or more. Uh, and there's a bit of a backlog right now because there are so many people who are applying. Um, but, uh, you know, Gail, what was your experience? How long from when you applied to when you got the check? <laughs> I had a paper check and it was two weeks. Two oh, weeks. yeah. That's so great. It might be yeah. a bit longer than that because of the backlog right now, but the process itself is pretty smooth. But again, that the the application process for that it can be found on the SEIU website. If you yeah, if you again go to the SEIU website and then uh, look for home care under contracts, um, you will see a whole guide to how to apply for this, as well as how to apply for that five hundred dollars stipend if you complete a set of voluntary trainings. And not to make it too overwhelming for people, but just the day before yesterday. A $200 stipend, also under as part of our union contract, just became available. Oh. Um, we haven't even gotten the word out yet to folks. We'll be texting and calling and emailing everybody about this soon. Uh, and this is to help to defray any costs that home care workers might face uh, associated with uh, using the new EVV systems that you know almost everybody is is now using. So um, when they when the electronic visit verification or EVV requirements uh, were announced a couple of years ago, we said, well, that's a change to our working condition. So the state of Minnesota has to negotiate with us over that. We had a kind of limited negotiation over that. And part of what came out of it was a $200 stipend. And that is now available through that same website. Okay, great. And you know, one of the things that we have not mentioned, and I think <laughs> I'm sorry that we haven't up to this point, but we probably should, is that all of these benefits that we're talking about, um, the, the increase in the wage, both at, on January 1st of 24 and 25, the stipends that Philip just described and all that, all of these are available to SEIU members who are employed by choice provider agencies, correct? Correct. Yep. All of all the benefits of the contracts apply to anyone who works in the PCA choice program, or the Consumer Directed Community Supports, CDCS, or Consumer Support, Support Grant, CSG program. The traditional PCA program is not covered by the union contract. Right, and I, I always take a moment to, to point that out when I'm in conversations with folks, because I think it's a very, very important distinction. Um, that being said, and, and just to kind of drill down a little bit, I mean, the, all of these additional benefits, the, 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 rate, the wage increases, the stipends and all that, I long overdue and certainly we endorse here at ACRA the, the best possible opportunities that we can provide for our PCA co-workers but I mean Gail maybe you could speak to this a little bit I mean these are significant increases as we've already acknowledged going from fifteen twenty-five to nineteen dollars an hour is significant how is this going to impact your life as a PCA for you and your family your your co-workers it's, How is this going to, what kind of an impact is this going to have for you? Be very, it's going to be great because right now at the 1525, I have to find another income to be able mm. to survive. And that takes me away from my person that I care for in my home. So being able to get to the higher weight rate of pay helps that I don't have to go outside the home as much to be able to provide care for my significant other. So it's just, it's huge because when a person needs you, you have more availability to be there for that person. So sure. it's just amazing. If, if I could add to that, please, um, yes, please. I remember the, the, the long late night that we uh, reached this agreement with the state. Um, Early morning back in January uh, of, of this year, early, early morning hours. Yes. One of the other members of the bargaining team, also a home care worker, uh, young 20 something uh, graduate student in college and dedicated caregiver with multiple, multiple clients, um, just sort of had this moment 
um, as we as we saw the wage scale, both the the wage floor increase and then especially the wage scale, where there's recognition for mm -hmm. developing experience and expertise in this workforce, and where the, the the if you have some of that experience, you might have a, a wage of of twenty one or twenty two or even twenty two fifty. Um, where she she just said she 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 um, we were all crying, but she she kind of burst into tears and she said. You know what? I've been planning to leave my work as a PCA to go to nursing school mm. because I want to have a decent life and be able to buy a house and do all the things that people want to do. And that and and it's made me so sad because I love being a PCA and that's what I want to do. And with this contract, with this wage scale, maybe I won't go to nursing school. Mm. Um, and just the the kind of relief and the, the the joy that she had in that you know it, it at that moment it was it was such a sort of radical idea and i'll just tell you since our union represents workers again in in all different parts of the healthcare industry that that worker that that pca ellen was was really onto something when she had that moment because actually the starting wages for this work are jumping ahead of the starting wages for CNA, certified nursing assistant, mm -hmm. and other kinds of uh, somewhat similar sorts of jobs in se not settings, not just nursing homes, but also in, in hospitals. Um, and uh, and so this is, this is, I mean, it is a form of recognition for the profession of caregiving that, as you said, David, is long overdue. Um, yeah, this, this, this job has been so invisible for so long, and now not only is it visible, it's actually getting the respect and the fair pay that is even better than you know some some equivalent jobs in healthcare that that have had unions and have had um, the ability to to win th things like this for a long time and and we hope that a lot of people start thinking not only about like Ellen did staying as PCAs but becoming PCAs right because right. they're attracted to having a decent wage right also, and you know Philip you. You, I'm sorry, Gail, please go ahead. No, I was just going to add too that we had a person on the bargaining team. She was, she had a staff person that was going to leave because we weren't getting paid enough. Mm -hmm. So, and then I'm just getting chills just thinking about it too. We had a um, person on the bargaining team that was a client and she, she, she got her own apartment now because she's able to get PCAs that would be able to be there for her. That was just exciting for me to hear that. Well, you know, and Philip, you mentioned how for so many years, this particular profession, and I use that word purposely, this particular profession was kind of hidden or not viewed with the level of dignity and, and respect that it should. And yet one of the arguments that I often make in conversations with legislators and, and others that are involved in being advocates and allies for people with disabilities like I am, is that PCAs and other direct care professionals really are, without a doubt, the very front line of healthcare in this country. They are with the individual on a daily basis. They know whether that individual is um, living in a safe environment. They know if that individual has, you know, fresh food in the refrigerator and it, it or if fresh food is available to them they know if there are you know our community resources nearby they know if they're living in a safe environment free from harm are they taking their medications and if they are are they taking them at full dose or all are they splitting them to stretch them a little bit all those social determinants of health that are so critical in the overall larger more holistic approach to health care the pca or the direct care professional is observing those things on a daily basis and they really need to be integrated into this larger healthcare picture you know in a, in a much greater fashion i've worked as a pca myself i do continue to work as a pca on occasion even now and i know that it's not always particularly glamorous work but it is so incredibly rewarding and valuable and it it as gail has described it brings about such incredible impacts in the lives of individuals who are the recipients of those services. So, I mean, to all of our listeners out there, to Gail, and, you know, I say thank you so very, very much 
for the dedicated work that you do. Philip, thank you and SEIU for, you know, being that that voice and that advocate for individuals who provide these services. Because again, as I just mentioned, it's not always glamorous, but boy, it is so rewarding and it is so incredibly necessary and needed to prevent those unnecessary out of home placements. It's the front line of healthcare. It really truly is. And please respond. Uh, Go ahead, Gail. Oh, yes, it is. It is the front line. And David, you have expressed all of that. We are there making sure that they are taking their medications. We do not give them their medications, but we do medication reminders to make sure that they are taking them and we can see that they are. And maybe they don't get out to do their grocery shopping. We do their grocery shopping mm -hmm. or help setting up those doctor's appointments, those medical appointments or any other important appointments for them. So really we are the front line. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Philip, would you add anything to that? Those uh, comments? It's, it's just, it's just so rewarding to see after so many years, uh, of, of effort and organizing and just striving to be recognized as uh, people who do really vital frontline work, as you were just describing, David, um, mm -hmm. that, that, that that is finally being met with the kind of respect and, uh, and, and understanding of the professionalism that it takes and of the value of that professionalism in, the, in improving the lives of, of people with disabilities and seniors who are, who are served by PCAs, by home care workers. It's, um, it, it's, it's a great thing to get to be part of, you know, there's, it's taken a lot of time. There's been so many people involved. There have been difficult moments and setbacks along the way. Um, but it feels like, you know, when, when we started organizing this group about 10 years ago, um, there were a lot of people, uh, in state government, state legislators, people like that, who, who didn't even know what a home care worker was, or didn't know what a PCA was. And I think I think those days are over. I think everybody knows what this what this workforce is and the importance of it. Um, and we're beginning to win the kind of respect that people have have long since deserved. Well, and if I'm remembering correctly, Philip, and maybe you can help me with this, but I thought in the past legislative session, I saw a statistic that came out of the Department of Employment and Economic Development that direct care workers in the state of Minnesota make up the single largest employee group in the state. Am, am I correct in that? Remember? That's correct. And growing, you know, by double digit percentages every year. Yeah. And I think that is incredibly significant. And, you know, the other to Gail's comment, one of my closest personal friends uh, happens to be an individual who experienced a spinal cord injury many, many years ago and has used PCA services um, to support his independent life for many years. And one of his PCAs has been with him for more than 20 years. And if that's not a career, I don't know what is. And I think that kind of incredible dedication should be applauded, rewarded, acknowledged. And in so many different ways, one of the ways that we can do that is by paying a decent wage and by offering other benefits like paid time off, like you know, acknowledgement of holidays and things like that. I think that is so critically, critically important in addition to acknowledging and rewarding it on different levels as well. But I, so I, again, I just, having worked as a PCA myself, I, I, I know what the work is like. Um, and I just, you know, Gail and all of your colleagues, your coworkers out there, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for the dedication and support. I have family members who use PCA services as well. It, it is a life changer for so many people because at the end of the day, ultimately what it does is prevents that out of home placement in an unnecessarily you know, segregating and isolating setting where the individual simply doesn't need to be. So again, thank you. You know, the other side of this coin is the reimbursement rate that is paid to providers like ACRA. Um, and out of this last legislative session, we also got an increase that corresponds with the wage increase um, that will go into effect January 21st of, or January 1st of 24 and uh, additionally January 1st of 25. We understand that that reimbursement rate isn't necessarily keeping pace exactly with the increase in the wages and we're dealing with that and ACRA has found a way to make that 
happen. And but we will conti be continuing to work on that, and and we know that SEIU is acknowledging that uh, circumstance as well, and and supports our efforts to increase that reimbursement rate as well. But I just didn't want to, the podcast to go without mentioning that as well. But the real focus here, obviously, is SEIU and the value that it brings to uh, the lives of the individuals who are their members, but also ultimately the real beneficiary of all of this is the client, the individual who needs and uses services. So anyway, yeah. I just wanted to, to say that. Philip, please. Yeah. yeah and uh, Gail said it before, but you know, the, the, the idea that there are people who are able to make decisions to live in an apartment on their own rather than yes. in a congregate living setting that they didn't want to be in and were experiencing all sorts of frustrations and even traumas in, um, specifically because they know that they're able to offer a wage that's going to keep keep workers able to come and provide them services. I mean, that is that's what these programs are for, and it is um, yeah, we're we're tremendously proud of um, of the work that we've done to be able to get to that stage. And we know there's so much more ahead of us. While we've achieved a decent wage and a number of other benefits that we've already mentioned, there's no retirement plan. Yeah. The, you know, the options for healthcare for most home care workers are, you know, very challenging uh, to afford. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so many other forms of, of recognition for this work that are needed. And so, um, you know, we will be back at the bargaining table with the state uh, at the end of next year, the end of 2024 for our next round. And we actually have an agreement from this last or the current contract that, that Gail helped to negotiate. Um, with the state to start conversations about retirement in advance oh. of our next round of negotiations. We don't know where those will lead exactly, but it's kind of a, an indication of a shared intention on both sides of the bargaining table to figure something out um, to establish some kind of means of secure retirement for, for home care workers. So, you know, that's, it'll be a year and a half before we have any news on that, but I just want to give people a picture of you know, the, the fight continues and we know that there's a lot more progress um, that needs to be made. Well, Philip, that is fantastic news. I'm, thank you for sharing that here today. I, I don't know if this is, if you're here, if, if our listeners are hearing it here first or not, but if, if they are, that's fantastic. And, and I hope that you know that ACRA will be right there with you, uh, supporting those efforts on behalf of the, the individuals that we count as co-workers here at, at ACRA who provide that direct service. So I think that's a wonderful next step and look forward to, to joining you in that, in that effort. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Gail, Philip, any final words before we sign off here on this podcast? Um, any final thoughts or that you want to leave us with? We also won uh, orientation. So that, that was huge. So we have an orientation plan that is in the works right now that they're working on to talk about when a person becomes a PCA, they will have an orientation. Mm -hmm. Us that have already been a PCA can also have this because we're still learning as, as we go along. We continue to learn everything and new things where to access and how to find out information. But this orientation will give us information on about the union, the different programs and everything that they're working on. And then you'll get another bonus for having taking the orientation. Fantastic. That's great. Um, Philip, could you please remind listeners of, you know, where they can find information about the, this new current contract? I mean, for those that are, are already members of SCIU that may not be aware of all the benefits that are now available to them as a result of this new contract, but also for folks who might be listening who are not members yet um, that might be contemplating this or... or Absolutely. Yep. So our website is SEIU. Oh, there it is on the screen. Fantastic. HealthCareMN.org. Um, and to find information specific to the home care contract, go to the contracts tab at the top and find home care. Um, uh, but then also, as David is, is mentioning, it's up to you to decide whether you want to be a member of the union and help to make things like we've been talking about during this podcast possible. Um, mm -hmm. If you are interested in becoming part of our union family, um, then you can sign up as a member just on the main uh, uh, 
page of the website. You don't need to go into the home care section. It's the same membership card wherever you work uh, in healthcare in Minnesota. And, um, and you can see the information there. You can also uh, reach out to us to talk to one of the staff of, of the organization if you have any questions. But we really do encourage everyone um, to be a member of the union, to contribute to the next fight, whether that's for retirement or health benefits or just bringing that wage scale up further. Um, it's really just up to the members. It's a democratic organization. So the members decide what, sh- what we should fight for um, mm-hmm. and how we should fight for it. Uh, and then we, we go to the bargaining table every two years and see what we're able to accomplish with our partners from the state. So the last thing I want to say is just um, we really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here with you all today and to share this good news with um, home care workers who are affiliated with Af- ACRA. Um, and it, it has really been great over a number of years now to have ACRA and to have you, David, in particular, representing ACRA as partners in our work at the Capitol and uh, everything that we do to move these standards forward for home care workers. We really appreciate um, the services that you provide. Well, thank you for saying that, Philip. I appreciate that very, very much. It's uh, very, very much appreciated. And I know that ACRA is very genuinely committed to our work with uh, SEIU and, and, and moving these issues forward. So again, Gail, Philip, thank you both so very, very much for being here with us today, for providing information about the new contract for our listeners, and uh, for also for giving you know information about where they can find more information about SEIU and the benefits of membership. So thank you so very much for both of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. And we look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Gail. Jason, under News and Views, we have an update for parents and spouses who are providing PCA Choice services. Now, we've mentioned this news in in the last episode, but because the deadline is coming up for parents, spouses, step parents, and legal guardians providing PCA services, we thought it was worth mentioning again. As a reminder, the COVID area nineteen, the COVID nineteen era rule temporarily allowed parents, spouses, step-parents, and legal guardians for children under 18, as well as for their spouses, to be paid as PCAs for their family members. The extension of this rule ends on November 11th, so parents and spouses will no longer be able to provide PCA care after that date until the implementation of CFSS. So if your family member or your client decides to enroll in another program, such as the Community Supports Grant, CSG, or the Community Directed Community Supports Program, CDCS, both of which allow parents and spouses to provide care, you should do so sooner rather than later to ensure the continuity of your care so that it doesn't interrupt or temporarily cease on November 12th. If you need more information about this, you can go to the blog on the ACRA website at acrahomecare.org to learn more. Jason? Yeah, thanks, David. Really important update for us to get to those PCA parents and spouses. Uh, And I think we have one other fitting piece of news, a celebration of sorts, uh, that is a great follow-up to our conversation with Philip and Gail. And we have this double dose of recognition for caregivers in November. Uh, Wonderful. November is National Family Caregiver Month. And the week of November 12th to the 18th is Home Care Aid Week. Uh, So caregivers, thank you for all the hard work that you do to serve your clients and help them live fulfilling independent lives at home in their community, uh, preventing those out-of-home placements that you talked about before, David. Uh, we know this is you know, such a labor of love, but it's also very demanding work too. And it's important we recognize your efforts with the PCA wage increases and also with celebrations like this here in November, uh, where all that hard work, um, all that you've done for, for older adults, people with disabilities and others uh, throughout the state and beyond to help them live happier lives at home. So thank you to all the caregivers out there. Absolutely. Thank you um, for that reminder. Jason, I appreciate that. And listeners, thank you again for tuning in to another episode of our podcast. Uh, We hope that you found the interview today with Philip and with Gail to be interesting and informative. I know that I certainly did. I always enjoy uh, my conversations with Philip, and it was really, really nice to have Gail join us today as well. 
Jason? Yeah, with that, we'll sign off. Make sure to follow and review Champions of Home Care on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and watch us on YouTube. See you later, David. Thanks, Jason. Take care. Thank you.